Hello and welcome to another Pod by the Fireside with me, Gregory Alexander Sharp, you know by now. You can call me Greg. Those of you that have been listening will already know that we've completed our five episode series dedicated to the lycanthrope. And in collaboration with Fenrir Thorvaldsen of Werewolf the Podcast, and I'm just getting a plug in for him quickly because he's very good at getting a plug in for me. We covered everything from mythology to movies to literature and even our own work. And if you haven't caught those episodes, just feel free to go and check them out, you know, if you want to. Nobody's forcing you, but it is free. So there is that. And if you're missing Fen, uh, you can always check out Werewolf the Podcast or cryptically just stick around here for a while. You may find that he shows up again, maybe sometime around Halloween, something like that. Just putting that out there. Anyway, this week we enter what will most likely uh, come to be regarded as business as usual mode which is essentially going to be getting into a cycle of interviews. A lot of interviews I've been really hoping to do, and I'm, I'm really pleased with the, the pipeline of guests on the show. You know, one of the things that's amazed me the most since becoming a published author has been the incredible community that's out there on social media. I have found it incredibly welcoming and supportive. And one of the most welcoming and supportive people I've had the good fortune to meet is this week's guest. So with no further ado, I'm very excited to be able to introduce you to a good friend of mine all the way from over in the United States of America. It's Mr. Adrian Lopez. Adrian, hello, mate. How are you doing? How's it going? How are you doing? Ah, pretty good. You know, it's, um, it's not been the best summer we've had in the UK, but it's, uh, it's dry outside right now after a bit of a rainy Friday. Yeah, it's, uh, the heat's finally starting to kick in uh, over here in Southern California, and apparently we have our first hur hurricane heading our way too for Southern California. Okay, well, we, we don't have that to put up with, so, uh, you know, we must be grateful for small, medium, and large mercies, I think. Hurricanes sound very yeah. frightening. So, let's get the show on the road, I guess. Adrian. Okay. It's fantastic to have you here. I'm absolutely chuffed that you're my first sort of business as usual guest. Um, why don't you just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, where you're from, uh, and what makes Adrian Lopez tick? So I've been raised most of my life in Southern California. Uh, I was actually born in Frankfurt, Germany. I was born in a military base. My father was in the military at the time. Um, came back when I was six months old and have been in Southern California ever since. Um, absolutely love sports, playing, watching. Uh, my favorites are NFL and hockey. Uh, I've always loved both of those sports. For me, it's 1A and 1B. I've always been a Lakers fan since I was a kid. Uh, so I've watched them forever as well, boxing, MMA, so just sports in general. Uh, School-wise or, or education-wise, um, I've always loved math. Uh, actually, seriously considered being a math teacher at one point, um, but then kind of went away from that more towards the business side. But even throughout my career and any of the jobs I've had, I've always still done teaching because I just love teaching. I love that portion of it. So. I've always been the one that, you know, have classes in the, in the company or I have uh, presentations where I'm showing people how to do things or explaining things. And I've always had um, somewhat of an ability, I guess, to, to explain it in a way where people understand it. So it's always been a good match for me to be able to kind of teach and, and be able to explain stuff in a way people can get it quicker rather than doing a straight like a textbook style or just straight do this do this do this i can kind of give them examples of you know something that they may understand and it kind of lets them understand it quicker um reading reading's always been something i enjoy but to be uh completely honest i've always been a little lazy about it uh, mainly because i've always uh kind of 
picked up things in school right away. So I can open a book, look through it and understand what it was and be able to take the test and stuff. So I got bad habits in terms of really sitting there and reading through things. So a little bit of a lazy reader, but when I do find something I enjoy, I can, I can read right through it. But that's always been a little bit of a struggle just because fortunately or unfortunately things came pretty easy uh, where I could learn it quickly or understand it quickly and just got some bad habits on that side of it. Okay, well, we've got a lot in common, actually. Um, that's for sure. Uh, the the feature of, uh, of you, which is an ability to sort of get your point across and, and to teach. My mum was a teacher and uh, that was something I always seemed to inherit from her, whether that be at sports or, or, or at work. Um, I think there's an aspect of storytelling that goes alongside getting people to understand what is bouncing around inside your mind um, mm -hmm. in a way that connects. So that's interesting to hear you say that. Yeah, I've always, um, I mean, I've always done it in a way where I really stay away from using some of the harder words or some of the bigger words and vocabulary to just try to figure out how do I explain stuff so it, it's easy for everybody to understand, right? I don't want to do it in a way where somebody has to go look something up or figure out what that is or, or you know, try to understand what that concept is. And I've always, I guess, kind of just taught myself how to be able to just do something, I don't want to say simply, but uh, very commonly where everybody, the entire room could understand rather than a portion and I have to explain it differently for somebody else. Very good. Well, I, I get you. You've got your point across very, very amply there. Um, and I think reading the room is kind of important too, right? So, so understanding yeah. your audience and what their needs are. And if there's a variety of needs in that audience, you need to sort of play to a certain common denominator that, that means that everybody's included. And I think that's a, that's a skill. So I happen to know that you have an interest in something else that we've got in common, actually, is a bit about Japanese culture. Um, now, for me personally, it's around martial arts. And I think for you, the martial arts aspect of Japanese culture that you might be connected with mostly is probably through movies, but I might have that only partly right. And I think Japanese film and, and um popular culture are quite important to you. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, Japanese culture in general has been something since I was a kid that I've just absolutely loved. Um, one of the biggest things is probably the influence of my uncle. Uh, my uncle was a huge, huge, huge book fan. Uh, he read constantly. I mean, I never saw him without a book in his hand. He absolutely loved books. He took care of books. He was a bookbinder by trade. He actually learned how to do it the old fashioned way where he would shave paper and build a book from scratch. And just, he just loved the whole concept. And he was the one that really got me into early on uh, some of my favorite books and then the cinema as well. And from that point forward, it's just, it's always been a love of mine. I mean, I've mentioned on a couple of podcasts and stuff, uh, my favorite books of all time is Jessica Amanda Salmonson's The Moe Bozen series, or her saga, which is in terms of three books. And what she did in those books, if, if nobody's ever read them, is she takes Japanese culture, traditional Japanese culture, she mixes it in with basically a mythical land where there's mythical creatures and magic and demons and fight scenes. And it's just, it's an amazing saga for those who have never read it. And those three books were just the books that really got me into, or I don't want to say got me into, but kind of reinforced my love for the Japanese culture. Then the cinema in general, um, I've always said they are some of the most beautiful some of the most well-made movies you'll ever see. And it's always a shame to me that a lot of people haven't seen them, right? You know, Kurosawa is probably the most well-known 
has the biggest name movie, but there's so many directors and movies out there that were just just beautiful, beautiful movies that people would fall in love with if they were to ever see them, but they're hard to find. I spent years trying to find some of these movies to be able to watch them, um, sw you know, even watch some of them without subtitles because I don't speak Japanese. And you would think I would at this point, but I never did learn it. And uh, it's just, it's, it's, uh, they're just amazing movies. I mean, Kurosawa has, again, the biggest name, but what's interesting is how much it's influenced cinema today that nobody even pays attention or realizes, right? I've mentioned in the past that Hidden Fortress is basically Star Wars. Um, and if you watch that, it's basically Luke, Leia, R2D2, C3PO. And you'll, you'll see the correlation between the two when you watch them. He did Throne of Blood, which is basically Macbeth, and it's another great movie he did. Um, Yojimbo Sanjuro are basically um, the no-name cowboy that Clint Eastwood did in his movies. So you see all these movies that are just basically redone, right? They're just <laughs> redone in American cinema or in, in Clint Eastwood's case, Italian cinema. and they're just beautiful movies. I mean, uh, he has a movie called Ikiru, which is about a, an older gentleman who's dying of cancer. And that's not only one of the most beautiful movies, it's one of the most sad movies when you watch it. But again, it's basically a masterpiece if you would watch that. And then a lot of people don't realize that, I don't even know if they've seen it, but the Lone Wolf and Cub series um, is basically Mandalorian. Because the Lone Wolf and Cub is basically this you know, rogue samurai who takes care of an infant and through all the three movies he's basically fighting off assassins and ninjas and just going through trying to protect this little kid. And that's if you ever get a chance to watch that, that's an amazing series as well. Fantastic. I mean you're clearly incredibly passionate about that. I'll be interested to see how some of that comes to the fore in some of the writing projects that you, you choose to take on um, either, you know, at this time or, or in the future. And maybe, maybe we'll get to that as we turn towards your writing. Now, when we, when we do that, I know of three projects of yours uh, and yeah. they are pretty different. Talk about a multi-genre yeah. author, right? That would be you for sure. Yeah. Children's book, romance and you're even edging in on my territory here adrian right yeah. with a werewolf scratching book. my way in <laughs> something that as you know is incredibly close to my heart too so um i don't know where should we start uh, why didn't i know there's i know there's um a, a, a tremendous backstory to juliana's bedtime stories i think yeah. you know maybe we should sensitively ask you if you can share a little about that with us too yeah, I mean, um, I've, I've touched on it on Twitter and some of the podcasts, but basically uh, my wife and I struggled with fertility for years. Uh, we tried all the different treatments, all the different, you know, processes you can do. Um, we finally did the full IVF treatment. We had an embryo, found out it was going to be a girl, named her Juliana implanted it but it just never made it through the full term pregnancy so we lost her um you know throughout the process at that point um you know for those that have gone through it or haven't gone through it there's a tremendous toll of emotional financial um that you go through uh, in that process i mean when you're going through fertility treatment, you're basically doing it month after month and you have the high of seeing if it's going to happen. And, and then the enormous low of nope, it didn't work. Right. And it's, it's hard to continually do that over and over and over again. And the one aspect that a lot of people don't really understand or maybe pay attention to is the toll it takes on the woman's body because of all the hormone treatments, of all the medication she has to take, of all the, you know, regimen she has to go through. And that was one of the things really when we start at the end, when it didn't work and we just said, you know, it, it maybe it just wasn't meant to be. We tried everything we possibly could. 
um, she noticed that there was changes happening because of all the treatments and stuff. And we don't know if there's long-term effects. I don't want to affect her house. So we made a decision together saying, okay, you know, we've tried everything. Maybe just this just wasn't meant to be for us. But you still have that pain and loss of where we knew we had the little girl. We had Juliana and it just didn't happen. So we had always thought, you know, what can we do to help heal? We had each other, right? We have each other to lean on. We are each other's foundation, strength, and then just our love helps us get through that. But we're always trying to think, what's another way to help that, to actually help that healing process? So my wife had always told me to write, you know, because I've always, since I was young, I've always written, but it's always just for me, right? I, I write poems all the time, but they're always just for me. I never showed anybody. Basically, till I met my wife, then I would write the ones for her. But I would do that always. It's just, it was something I do. I'd always write stories, but it was always for me. I never showed it to anybody, gave it to anybody. Um, so she was like, why don't you write something? Why don't you, you know, just write as therapy, which it is for me. That's just my way to kind of sit there, relax and go through it. And finally, you know, we were thinking one day and I finally thought, what if I do a children's book um, in honor of Juliana? So we really thought that was a great idea to do. And at the same time, you know, I talk a lot more about Juliana, but the two most important people to me in my life were my grandparents. And they were really the ones that taught me humility, respect, just everything across the board that I am today. And I really thought that one of the best ways to honor Juliana and them was to basically tell the stories I would have told her anyway, right? The, the stories of my grandparents. So I figured I'll do them as a series of bedtime stories, right? So every book that I will do in the series is me tucking her in and telling her a new story about my grandparents, right? So it keeps their memories alive. It keeps their stories alive. And basically, it kind of keeps Juliana's memory alive as well. So that's... That was the background of why I decided to do this. And the book that's actually finally out now, I mean, I was hoping it'd be out a while back ago, but it's finally out now, is is the story of every summer when I was a kid, we would always go to Yosemite in California. That was our summer trip. I always knew the end of the school year, within a week or so, we we're gonna pack up and go to Yosemite um, to go to the river, the mountain, the waterfalls and everything. And I thought that would be the perfect first story for the bedtime stories is, is explaining to her what that meant, what you see, what's what happened there. And that's really what the first book is about. That's a very beautiful story in itself, Adrian. And thank you for sharing. I think the, uh, the fact that you share your experiences and, and that of your wife uh, in this area is really important and it's 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 supporting a lot of people um so i i think i speak on behalf of a lot of people that have maybe been through similar times and challenges and heartache when i say thank you for sharing i really appreciate that yeah i mean um i know i've mentioned i'm going to probably start writing some articles on my medium account which i have i just haven't used it I was kind of waiting for the book to come out for that reason. I do want to share a little more of that. And, you know, not that I choose to be the voice of it, but maybe I can help other people that are struggling with that. Um, I just did a, a podcast, my podcast interview with uh, Shannon Pennington for Spinal Cord Injury Awareness Month because uh, she was in an accident. And one of the things we discussed on there is she was saying that not a lot of people really understand or, or think about it. And one of the points that we we're talking about is even with, you know, fertility, endometriosis and everything, it's really a word to a lot of people until they experience it, right? S similar with cancer, similar with a lot of things. You, you hear it, you don't, you don't really understand how it affects the individuals or their families or friends until it happens to somebody you know or it happens to you, right? And that's 
that's the thing. It's a lot of times people silently suffer and, you know, yes, it's painful, but if I can put it out there and help some people with it, definitely I, I'm, I would like to do that. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Listen, the book itself, the, the publishing process. So typically what we see with new um, new authors is there's a few different options available these days. And I think it's interesting for our listeners to to get a feel for what options are available and, and how do some of the people that they're engaging with um, choose to bring their creativity to life? And I'm thinking about, you know, traditional publishing uh, uh, contracts, uh, self-publishing at the other end of the scale, perhaps, and somewhere in the middle, there's now a range of publishing services organizations. Which route did you choose to go down with Juliana's bedtime stories? So I chose... Um to use Amazon publishing, which is basically um, you pay them for the services, but it's an all included service. So you get 25 copies of whatever version I chose hardcover. Um, they put it on Ingram Spark and KDP. They do all the loading for you. Um, they do the, the editing, they do the illustration, they do the cover, everything. It's like a one-stop shop kind of thing. Um, so I chose to do that because, again, these are really my first books. And I'm someone that likes to learn a process and then basically take it over from there. So I wanted to basically say, okay, how are, how are they doing it? What's, what do I need to do going forward? Because I plan to do a bunch of these. So I was like, okay, kind of giving you guys the steering wheel here to start. Let me see what's involved, what needs to be done, and from that point, I'll I'll, I'll take it over. It's um, it's a good option for, like I said, the one-stop shop for somebody that's interested in doing it. It does have its limitations, though. So, a lot of the struggles or the frustrations I had was the limitations that are there, right? So the illustration side is limited to a, a point you, you have a lot of say in what you want but the styles and certain things are limited to what they do right and that was a frustration because my wife and i had a vision for what we wanted and that was slightly taken away because they had basically a wheelhouse of illustrations i still think they came out beautiful but is it the original vision we had no and going forward, we'll go back to the original vision of what we wanted these books to look like. Um, another frustration I had was I wanted the children's books to be both in English and Spanish. So I wanted mm. the line in English and below it the line in Spanish. So it can be for, you know, multiple children to be able to read it. They didn't want to do that. They're like, no, it's not going to look right. So little things like that where you have frustrations even though you're paying for the package there's some frustrations and right. certain things they just weren't willing to do right and that's again if you're thinking of doing a one-time book you want to get something out you don't know what's involved it's a good way to go but if you're really thinking of going and doing a bunch of books or series and stuff probably better to figure it out i i did the kdp myself for the romance story Mm -hmm. um, basically because I wanted to learn how to do it. So I said, okay, let me figure this out. Let me write a short story to put on there uh, to figure out how to load it, how to do everything, because that's how I like doing it. I like to figure it out and see how you do it. So I did both to make sure the children's book was done properly, and I did the romance short story to kind of test out how do I do this? How do I do KDP? How do I load it up? Um and that's what the separation. So again, it, it is a good option. There's a lot of different ones. There's one called Book Baby, who I thought about as well, which is also like a one-stop shop. And But you're going to have limitations, right? You're going to have limitations in terms of what their illustration is, kind of what their structure is, because they may not be willing to do some of the things you, you're thinking of with your book, which is really why, you know, just self-publishing is the way to go, because it's really what you want to do. It's really your vision, your ideas, your style. And, um, you know, it's just, it's your baby. So you kind of do it the way you want to do it. Right. I guess the difference, the, the key difference between 
a publishing service and going all out self-publishing is around with a publishing service you're buying access to a curated process yeah. right and the key there is exactly. that you're buying a curated process so you're giving up some of the control of the execution yeah. of that process right you kind of come along for the ride you bring your creation with you uh, and then the service provider takes ownership of the of the process of of bringing that to life to life or bringing yeah. it to the market with a um a true self-publishing route uh, it's all on you right which is a good thing and yeah. a bad thing right because if anything goes wrong you've got no one to blame um but you yeah. do have ownership and control of the execution of the process as well right and there's a there's an investment uh, side to both of those two so i think there's a few things that, that new authors need to to put in the balance there and say well look what's going to work out right for me I mean, I think you, you, you strike on a really good point there about learning how this stuff works uh, early in an author's career too. Um, and maybe taking what you learn from that first book or, or first couple of books and, um, and seeing if you can take up the challenge on your own. Yeah. So the romance book is a, it's an interesting one, right? A very different genre. I know it's a short story, uh, but but what made you write a romance? Was it something you always had, a, I'm going to say, a burning desire to write a romance, if I can say that? Yeah, so the romance short story was, again, a couple of things involved with that. Uh, one, I had already signed up for the Amazon publishing uh, to do Juliana's Bedtime Stories. But I wanted, I heard about everybody doing KDP, doing the self-published. So I said, okay, what is involved? with uh, KDP, how, how do I do it? How do I, you know, what's involved with it? So I signed up and I started doing some research and saying, okay, you know, what's the most searched genre? And basically it came up romance, right? So I said, okay, let me actually, let me test myself. Let me kind of get out of my comfort zone and let me try a short story. Um, and basically what I did was, again, I've written poems forever, right? Um, I've done it since I was a kid. I, I'm i the one that every time writes the birthday cards or cards, you know, they wind up crying. So I've always, <laughs> I've always done that with my writing. So, you know, I was really thinking and basically a lot of the, a lot of the poems I write um, are somewhat love related, right? They're finding love, losing love, or just being in that middle of love, right? Um, all of those things enhance when I found my wife. So more meaning, right? More meaning behind any of those those poems or messages. So when I looked it up and I searched and I said, okay, you know, romance seems to be the main thing. Uh, but again, I I want to do in almost anything I do. I want to do something slightly different. I don't want to do the same things. So I didn't want to write just a romance story, right? What, how do I do it a little different? And basically, you know, one of the things that's right within that genre, but it's a big genre, is soulmates, right? Soulmates, twin flames, karmic, you know, when they start talking about all those different things. And, you know, I took in that story, who, if anybody's never read it, I basically took the COVID time where people were working online and not really getting out and they're just working all the time. I took two uh, career individuals that basically meet on a site and just start talking and, and basically they find out they have not not just a lot of common, but they just, you know, to, to take the term, complete each other, right? They just, everything feels comfortable. Everything feels like it was meant to be. Um, and that's what the story is. It's going from just somehow joining, finding that person, and then finding out that that really was the person you were meant to be with. And that's where the story takes itself. Um, similar to my my wife and I, is that we were both career individuals, right? We work a ton, um, but we are basically the perfect match for each other. We do balance each other out between between who we are our personalities 
and everything. And that's kind of what the story was about. When you find that perfect match, how comfortable, how easy, how everything just seems to fit together, right? Is it always perfect? No. Do you not, not argue anything? No. It's just, that's not possible. Right? It's just not going to happen. But it's, you know, what you come out of that, you know, if it's, it's the compromise for each other, it's the understanding the other person's point of view, it's respecting the other person, which a lot of people seem to forget that part of it, right? Um, and that's what really that story is. It's just a short version taking you on the journey from finding, realizing, accepting and then moving forward together very nice too and those two books juliana's bedtime stories and the romance short story the soulmate's journey both available mm -hmm. right now on amazon yeah the soulmate's journey is since it's a short story it's only available in ebook format uh juliana's bedtime story is available ebook paperback and hardcover cool very good now the big one right the exciting yeah. one for me um your your next your next public published work is the werewolf story tell us all about it how are you publishing it what's the story what was the inspiration this is an exciting one so there's a lot of aspects that go into this so at the same time i read uh tomoe goes in saga my uncle had given me another book which was just a collection of short stories I cannot remember what the name of the collection was. I cannot remember the name of the story. I searched everywhere to find it. One of the short stories in there was a character who has to fight his way into hell. And basically he is a werewolf. So there's this entire scene where he's transforming and just tearing through demons on his way into hell that just, again, put that image in my head and just, I just fell in love with that story. And that image of this, you know, kind of like you mentioned in your podcast that the kind of the correlation to Hulk and the werewolf, yeah. right? That yes. turning into the, the primal beast. Because uh, Hulk has always been my favorite character too, since I was a kid. And that entire short story of, of him transforming, just tearing through these demons as he's fighting his way in, always just stuck in my head. I just always loved that image. Um, but then horror movies in general, I've just always loved. I've loved all the classics, watched all the classics. Uh, my wife is a huge horror fan as well. So, you know, that's my partner to watch all these things. So we watch all of those as well. I've always just loved that, that genre, right? So it basically started, and it wasn't me really saying, you know what, I want to do a werewolf story. It was basically one day, I had an image in my mind of a scene, right? And I go, wow, that's kind of a crazy scene. And then I said, okay, well, what, what would lead up to that scene? And then basically from that point, it just worked its way into a story. Um, so I, I really did this uh, in a way where I wrote three major scenes. And, you know, they, they changed over the period as I wrote it, but the three major scenes really gave me the storyline. And then I wrote the whole story from that. But one of the things, again, is what I'm always trying to do is I wanted to do it differently than a lot of the other stuff, right? So a lot of the other ones you always see is somebody gets bitten or somebody's cursed or there's something that leads to them being the werewolf, right? To being that, that member. And what I did is I really studied um, more of the folklore of Lycoen, uh, which is the original werewolf. And basically, I did a storyline of his bloodline, right? And to not give too much away, basically, his bloodline, they hid away far away in, in the woods, and they basically became farmers, but farmers are mostly cattle, pigs, and goats, and that's what they fed on. So they didn't go into the town. They stayed anonymous people didn't have, didn't find them didn't look for them nobody even knew they were there they were so far back in the woods in the mountains that nobody even saw them back there right so that's part of the storyline and then the main character was from this town actually was sent away as a child and comes back from the death of his uncle and that's kind of where the whole thing 
starts happening and he has to make a decision, does he join the original bloodline or does he kind of say, uh, wait a minute, this is not right. I need to kind of to step back here a second because there is a, a younger breed, I would say, of werewolves who are not, are tired of feeding on cattle, right? And they're like, right. why are we doing this? Why, why do we need to do this? We're superior. Why are we have all the food out there we need? Why do we have to grow our own food, right? And that's a struggle that he has to go through and figure out what he wants to do back in his village and with his bloodline. So that's really what the story was. And I just had a lot of fun writing it because I wrote it more from his point of view, right? So a lot of, a lot of it is his internal dialogue as he's seeing the situation, um, as he's figuring it out and moving through it. Because again, I wanted to come from a little different angle. I even had fun with it where I put some Easter eggs in there. Um, he's a, he's a lawyer in the big city that, that comes back. And the book opens up with a case that he's working on. And in the case, the case number is actually the original publication date of the first uh, werewolf book, which was called The Man Wolf. And the case number is the publication date, which is 0101-1831. So, you know, no, nobody's going to pick that up. But it was just Very fun nice. for me to do that. Um, <laughs> oh, spoiler they, alert. My, they, my two books are absolutely littered with stuff like that as well. Absolutely littered. It's just fun, it's right? It's just fun avoid. even if nobody catches it. Um, <laughs> they celebrate in a Japanese restaurant and... The, the name of the restaurant is basically Wolf in Japanese, <laughs> which uh, I named it too. So nice. just a lot of little things like that that I threw in there, mainly for me, right? Whether anybody, anybody ever finds it. Well, and for, for the hardcore genre fans, right? Because there will be folks out there that will spot that. And, um, you know, I was, I was discussing this with Fenrir recently in a podcast that we did together. And, you know, he gets a real thrill out of spotting that stuff when he's reading or when he's watching a movie and sees another movie referred to within it. And he's like, I know not everybody got that, but I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the fun part when you do catch those and you do see those. Yeah. And that's, I mean, really that's, that's kind of where I went with this. Again, I wanted to go a little away from the norm. So I said, okay, let me, let me try it with an actual bloodline. And it's been there. It's been hidden. Nobody's really ever paid attention to it. And now, now it's going to be a little bit of a problem. Um, I've actually written, I would say, half of book two uh, that would go along with it. Um, and that one takes a completely different turn because as I was finishing the story, I had the idea of, wait a minute, what if I take it this way for a second book? And that's a lot of fun, too. That just went a completely different direction. How exciting. Well, I very much look forward to hearing about that when you're at a stage in the process where you feel able to, to share some of the details. But don't don't give away your best stuff before you've got it all written down. That's what I always yeah, say. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so talking of what's next, is that the next book? Is there something else in the works? What is what is next for Adrian Lopez? So there's a. Uh... There's actually too many things I do, but there's a couple of things that I'm doing, right? So I have the podcast that I'm doing as well, just like you do, uh, interviewing authors. And similar to what you do, I really, the whole purpose of it and what I thought about this was, you know, as you say, we have a community of authors, writers, or just friends in general on Twitter. And one of the things that is somewhat frustrating is how talented all of you guys are, but not a lot of people get to see you. You guys are not in stores, so nobody finds you, right? You don't have a big publishing house marketing you, so you're doing your own marketing. So you may never be found, which is a shame, right? And I thought, what if I do that? And that's part of my, you know, tag on the podcast is really finding that treasure, that treasure hunt as a reader, finding that author or book you've never heard of. And that was kind of my goal, you know, whether or not I ever get a lot of viewers or so, even if I can bring you guys and your work to some people that may have never seen you, then I, I've, I've accomplished something, right? Because 
everybody needs the eyes. Everybody just needs to be seen. And you, it's, nobody is less talented than anybody that got a publishing contract. It's just you're not seen. You're not you're not out there. And hopefully, I can get some eyes on everybody so they can be seen and their works checked out. And maybe at one point somewhere in the future they become a household name. But even if I can get some just to be noticed and, and read, that then I feel like I accomplished something on that side. Well, you're doing a very good job of that, I have to say. And uh, there, there's a small kind of nucleus of highly active um, promoters of of indie authors out there, and you're right in the very center of the bullseye of that of that group. And uh, you do do tremendous stuff. And uh, I, for one, am very grateful uh, for everything you do. And, um, you know, you're, a, you're an inspiration to me and a, a lot of others in, in the same sort of position. So thanks, Adrian. Appreciate it. You're welcome. And I, I appreciate the words too. I mean, again, I, I just feel everybody should be seen, right? I feel everybody needs the opportunity and you know, if I can do something to help that, I, de I definitely want to. I, I definitely will try my best to do that. Um, awesome. Awesome. And then in terms of other stuff that I've planned, so there's a lot of little that I didn't even know was available, but there's a lot of little like monthly horror writing contests, those short stories. Uh, I've been writing a La Llorona story for one of the horror contests I'm going to turn in. Uh, I've been writing a zombie short story for another writing contest I saw to turn in. Um, I, 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 you know, again, I love the horror genre, so I thought those would be great ones to, to test out before I even try writing a, a larger book on that stuff. I think a short story is a good way to, to get in there and, again, try to do it a different angle. Again, I, I just like doing things different angles. And I have a bunch of other children's stories, several I've already written, um, that are completely different from Juliana's bedtime stories, which are actual children's stories, right? Um, and I tried again to keep them a little different because really, if you look at a lot of children's stories, they are almost, not almost say always, but a lot of them are animals that act like humans, right? They're talking and that's the way to get the children involved in the story and, and enjoy it. And they're great books. I'm not saying, I'm not, but again, I like to do things a little different. So a lot of the ones I want to do, one of the ones I wrote is more of an action story for children, but again, it, it involves children. Children are the heroes of it and it's seeing their peers doing stuff. Right. And I thought that would be, that's a little different than what you normally see um, to actually see their peers be the hero. And again, I, I mentioned this before. I come from a family of, all female, right? All sisters, all nieces, um, with my wife. Um, uh, and I just, I, I want to give that strong female character, that strong female, uh, image for them and for other females out there, right? It's, it's part of the reason I do the sister shout outs I do on Twitter. It's, it's just something I've always done. I support sit my sisters, my family, stuff like that. And, in the stories on the children ones, I've had in the action one, I make the little sister the, the hero of the book, right? Again, give them that role model. Let them know it doesn't always have to be the male. It doesn't have to be the brother that, that saves them. They can do it on their own because that's that's the message they should be given, right? They, they can do everything they want to do. They're capable. They're just as smart, if not smarter. They can do it all, and, and hopefully – you know, a lot of the books, when I start writing some of those, it gives them that image and it gives them that role model to look at. Fantastic. Well, listen, Adrian, thank you ever so much for spending some of your time with me and with our listeners today. I really, really appreciate uh, all the insights that you've shared with us. And um, I'm sure everybody's going to be checking you out on Twitter and check buying your books on Amazon and checking out your podcast as well. Links in the description, folks. You'll find links to all Adrian's stuff in the description of this podcast. And um, I hope you do go and check that out. And thank you to all our listeners on Pod by the Fireside. 
We'll be back next week with another interview. So watch this space for that. But for now, thanks, Adrian. Cheers. Have a good day. I appreciate it. I, I love this. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Greg. That's cool. Thank you, mate. Cheers. Bye-bye, everyone. We'll see you next time. <laughs>